Hey guys, Doyle again. Welcome back to another episode of Deck Profiles, where today I'm super excited to share the list for my undefeated Labyrinth deck profile. So went through locals, completely cleared uh, the uh, the four rounds undefeated uh, with this deck. I do think there are a lot of room for improvements in it, but Labyrinth as a whole is just this really powerful resource engine deck that has a lot of tools at its disposal that many decks honestly just can't handle. So really excited to share this. Let's go ahead and jump into the deck profile, starting with the main deck. So first we have the monsters. We're playing two copies of Lady Labyrinth of the Silver Castle, one copy of Lovely Labyrinth, one copy of Ariane, and one copy of Ariana for our Labyrinth monsters. Um, so a couple things about this. Number one, I don't actually own more than two copies of Lady Labyrinth. If I did, I would be playing three, and I'd probably actually take out the Lovely. Um, I was fortunate enough to pull the Collector's Rare of Lovely, so I'm playing that in place while I'm uh, looking to get my third copy. And in general, just kind of on that note, uh, Lady is absolutely the strongest Labyrinth monster in your deck by far. This card provides a ton of resources, provides you know, a very strong boss monster for you to just go into off of your kind of main labyrinth place. So she is uh, absolutely incredible. In the meantime, and actually funnily enough, one of the reasons I would actually cut Lovely is, uh, believe it or not, the 2900 attack stat on Lovely actually comes up quite a lot. You'd be surprised how many just boss monsters there are running around in the competitive meta right now. Like even things like um, Kashtira, Arise Heart, like, it just feels better to have a 3k because at worst you're trading with some of these monsters if you get to the point with that, and the 2900 on Lovely actually comes up a lot, so that's one problem we, we don't have with, with Lady, so that would be definitely my number one recommendation for a change there, but for now, it worked and it served me quite well. I also want to quickly talk about uh, Ariane and Ariana. Uh, these two cards form kind of an incredible resource engine for you. They get you a lot of free extra draws. And if you do end up drawing Ariane, the one on the left, first, basically that gets you into Ariana, which gets you your uh, Labyrinth Field spell. So basically, on the chance that you're kind of getting either of these, you're getting them on the field, you're definitely, you're always getting your Field spell um, off of it for sure, whether regardless of which one you draw. And uh, it just opens you up to getting free draws, free extra pops off of your welcome cards. Like they, they just, they're so valuable even just as one of. So honestly, I don't know if I would completely cut either of these cards. I think they are worth playing in their own right. You could argue playing maybe more Ariana's than Ariane's, just because Ariane does require you to send a normal trap to use its effect. But honestly, for the sake of getting two monsters on field that draw, potentially draw you twice and the field spell, which gives you pops, like it just, it, it seems really high value even for that one discard. So always felt good to resolve and actually won me a few games. So that's it for the Labyrinth monsters. Over to the other main deck monsters, we are playing two copies of Nibiru and one copy of the Lord of Heavenly Prison. As you can see immediately, we are playing a lot of big boss monsters in this deck, for sure. We got a lot of 3k beaters, um, and that is relevant when we get into kind of the spell trap lineup in just a moment. But right now, honestly, Nibiru is the probably one of the best hand traps. You know, board breakers have a ton of value in this format. Nibiru absolutely eats Cash Tira for breakfast. And uh, Lord of Heavenly Prison in particular is an absolutely amazing card to have in this deck, even as a one of. Being able to protect your back row when you already have a lady on board basically makes your lady invincible. Like, there's no... It's really challenging to out Lady in the case where you can't get rid of the back row supporting her. So it's it's very powerful. And as always, uh, you'll see some of the fantastic search targets in just a moment. But uh, Lord definitely does help keep kind of that continuous resource engine going for this deck. So uh, you may have the question why we're playing so much of these good cards if they are so good at one. 
Honestly, it comes down to not wanting to repeatedly draw the same card over and over. We actually do struggle if we continually see the same cards or the same types of interactions in these types of trap decks. So really wanted to minimize and always kind of draw into new stuff that are, you know, new valuable resources, new removal tools, new boss monsters, things like that. So right now, other than swapping Lovely for a Lady... I'm actually quite happy with the monster lineup. I will say uh, we are only playing the two Nibiru just kind of for space. We do have the third one in the extra deck, and we'll get, or excuse me, in the side deck, so we'll get to that shortly. But uh, that's it for the monsters. So in the main deck, we're only playing eight monsters for this one. Now, over to the spell lineup. Got a lot of draw spells, and this kind of comes into play with that resource engine we talked about earlier. So we're playing three copies of Pot of Extravagance and three copies of Pot of Duality. And I will say, this, these two combined just sets up such an incredible draw resource engine for this deck. It is so awesome how often you're able to just dig and find pretty much everything you need from your welcome spell traps to your any of your boss monsters um and it just actually it, it it came up in one game that i did end up losing uh in in the middle of a match because i actually drew into too many draw cards i i think i drew extravagance off of extravagance and duality off of duality in in one uh, one game so that's kind of that's kind of speaks to my earlier point about wanting to see more and more resources uh, that aren't the ones you already have because that is where this deck would potentially struggle. But every other game, you're just you know I I felt like I opened Extravagance every game and it always felt great because surprisingly few people are playing Ash Blossom right now. So a little bit of an interesting mix, but uh, hey, getting those extra resources to start you out always helps for sure. And lastly, for the spells, we're just playing the one of Labyrinth Labyrinth. And again, I actually did get super lucky and did pull the Collector's Rare for this. Um, I probably would consider, if, if I did get a hold of my third copy of Lady, I would probably consider shuffling up my ratios for the Labyrinth cards. Maybe this would be a good one to substitute a second Ariana for, potentially, just to kind of get into the trap card searches rather than the field spell. But again, where they just kind of play off of each other, one monster gets another, the monster gets the field spell, and that just kind of sets you up really nicely. For now, I, I'm very happy with this, and I actually felt quite good about it. I will say, this card was my number one side out for every every time we, we got to game two in each of my matches. So just something to keep in mind. It, it, going second, you would never want to draw this card. So there's definitely a lot of flexibility with that as well. Um, and that's actually it for the spell lineup. So we're only playing the eight monsters and we're only playing the seven spells. So that's uh, 15 total. So yeah, if you're doing math right on a 40 card deck, this is a trap deck. So we're going to get into the traps here. So starting out, we're playing three copies of Big Welcome Labyrinth and three copies of Welcome Labyrinth. So, I mean, these are your primary tools to get into your main deck boss monsters, your lady. Um, Big Welcome is absolutely incredible in combination with uh, with Lady, it really just, I mean, she just bounces back to the hand off of Big Welcome's effect. You get to trigger any of your monster effects and you get to immediately get her back. And depending on the board situation, you know, maybe your opponent's passed to the battle phase, this is actually a really effective way to dodge around cards like Evenly Matched and Big Board Breakers like that. So absolutely awesome cards. You probably always max out on three on both of these for this deck. Now, speaking of evenly matched, and this is kind of where we start getting into some of the spice of this deck, um, we are actually main decking three copies of evenly, and I have to say, I know right now we're in a bit of a format where, you know, huge board breaker cards like this are super effective going into the second and third game. I will say that of every card in this deck, evenly matched was easily my MVP for the uh, the tournament that I played this deck in. It just, I, I'll, I'll put it this way, it felt like it was glued to my hand every game and I lost almost every dice roll. So it just, I mean, that right there, obviously that's a unique situation. Not every tournament's gonna go like that, but at the same time, 
this card just, it, it heavily pulled its weight. I would say across all four rounds I played, this card in total probably banished about, I, I'd say, I'd say 20 cards total, um, at minimum for, for it across all the games I played because it just, it just came up and people just weren't expecting it. Um, so there was a lot of board commitment, there was a lot of play commitment, and it just got rid of everything that could have been in conflict. I do think Evenly Matched, by far, is the most mandatory side deck card in the format right now. If you are playing a deck like um, Labyrinth or even like Trap Tricks or other back row heavy decks, I would strongly consider uh, for, for you, like, I would strongly recommend considering put, running this card in the main deck. It is, it, it, it wins games, and honestly, I mean, we do play cards that discard or cards that use other hand resources as well, like the uh, Ariane and Ariana, so, you know, it, it doesn't even feel bad to draw it if you're going first a lot of the time. And a lot of the time you're on Mission Survive if you're going first, where you just kind of set up Lady and kind of hope for the best that you can survive till your next round. And if you make it there, usually you commit a lot of your resources. And by that point, your board's fairly empty or, well, it has to be empty for you to use this. And you, you get the comeback resource uh, from, from that. So absolutely happy with Evenly Matched for sure. On to some of the other removal tools we're playing. We're playing Triple Compulsory Evacuation Device and Triple Dogmatica Punishment. Both just great generic removal tools. Pop all of, or proc, excuse me, all of your uh, Labyrinth cards effects for extra draws and extra removals and things like that whenever monsters leave. And also resetting uh, some of your welcome cards. And actually, probably a change that I would be most excited if I were going to remake this list Two copies of Terrors of Overroot. This card really pulled its weight during the tournament. I would probably consider pump bumping this card up to three. Because, well, for those of you who don't know this card, this is a, a bit of a newer card. It actually just came out of Power of the Elements over the last year. Um, what this does is effectively, you target a card your opponent controls and a card in their graveyard. You send the card from the field to the grave, and if you do, you set the other card that was in the graveyard back to your opponent's field. And the important thing about this is, number one, this targets any card. This can be field spell, back row... Pen scales, um, you know, monsters, like it, this, this card targets anything from both. It targets anything from the field and anything from the graveyard. So basically, if you're in a situation where your opponent is, say, you know, out resource managing you because they have more monsters, for example, and they've committed, you know, I'll use sprites as an example, they've committed cards like uh, Sprite Starter already in the turn, and those are obviously hard once per turn cards. It's just a really great tool to take, like, that level 2 monster that they just summoned off of Sprite Starter off the field so they can't get more free special summons onto the field and reset basically a useless card, which you easily clear with any of your removal tools on your next turn. So, this is absolutely a card I'm surprised more people aren't talking about. I think this card is absolutely incredible. And it really gives you a lot of flexibility in kind of picking your poison or, or otherwise managing what you're actually playing against, against your opponent. So this card is great. I wish it didn't target, but at the end of the day, the fact that it is a send and that it can apply to any type of card, Monster Spell Trap, is easily, easily makes up for that restriction. So awesome card. Definitely consider playing this if you haven't already. It's also a common, so it should be really easy for you guys to get a hold of. And actually, while I'm there, the one of slot that's taking over for the third copy is one copy of Trap Trick. Um, this is basically access to any card in your entire deck at this point. Um, you know, you run so many normal trap cards. It, it's, it's just a consistency tool. You would never want to draw two of this. This card feels incredibly bad to draw multiples of because it does lock you into kind of your final trap for the turn and you're a trap deck. So you never want to be in that situation. But the fact that it gets you anything is, is really nice. So as a one of, perfect. 
and over to kind of our floodgate tools. And this is kind of how we help uh, manage our resources and deal with uh, our, our opponent's plays. We are playing three copies of Dimensional Barrier and three copies of Skill Drain. Um, a lot of the time, I'll speak to Skill Drain first, just because it's probably one of the more controversial ones. You do, because we do play so many big boss monsters like Lady, Nibiru, uh, even Heavenly King, Sky Prison, a lot of the time the deck state will boil down to Lady Beats or Nibiru Beats or, or Heavenly King, Heavenly Prison Beats, because you just happen to be able to get out these free, huge bodies that, uh, you know, uh, it, people can't really deal with under skill drain. There is a lot of heavy reliance on monster effects now. That's, it's been that way for probably the past at least three years, and, and it continues. So while we have skill drain available to us, we're going to use it. Um, same with dimensional barrier. I actually ran into a pendulum matchup during my, my tournament um, time when I played this, and I will say... Deep Barrier definitely does pull its weight. Oh, I also ran into a Ritual matchup as well. And on both of those, it, it basically turned off both of those players' turns, kind of forcing them down bad cop-out link play lines. And it it didn't end up going much of the way. I think actually one of those games, I had both of these cards online at one point, And it was, yeah, it it, it definitely uh, didn't, didn't go well for the other player. We'll say that. But, uh, and in, as an additional uh, kind of uh, floodgate, we are playing the one of for our final trap card, one of Rivalry of Warlords. This, honestly, this would probably be a card that I would consider cutting maybe for that third copy of Overroot, just to kind of get more removal tools and get more uses out of our effects. I find... I'm, I'm a bit at odds with cards like Rivalry and Goes and Match and There Can Be Only One because I find they're just so... I'll put it this way. If you compare cards like this to Skill Drain, which there is, unless you are playing against a deck of 40 traps or 40 spells, there are no decks that Skill Drain will not have some kind of effect on. Whereas cards like Rivalry, Goes in, and There Can Be Only One it's literally a coin flip of if your card is useful against your opponent or not. I've actually seen a lot of games, even just kind of walking around at my tournament shop and watching games played, that ended up being losses because one of the players had one of these types of cards up on the field and their opponent just was ignoring it because, you know, I mean, rivalry can only control one type opponent happened to be playing sprite and they just drew all their sprite cards so everything was thunder right like it it didn't it didn't do anything against them and and with cards like sprite being so popular um cards like rivalry and things like that it just some of them don't feel as effective as others so i mean this could be a interesting card for you guys to maybe experiment with flipping to another one of those floodgates i mentioned like goes in or there can be only one and see if that one works better at your locals or your tone tournament store and that's it for the main deck. So that is 40 cards, and that was eight monsters, seven spells, and a whopping 25 traps for us. So that's the main. Let's go over to the uh, extra deck where things get a little bit interesting because, as you saw, we are playing the uh, pot, various pots to kind of help us out, including Pot of Extravagance. And with that, we kind of have to adjust our ratios very interestingly. So I'll first talk about kind of this package here. So we got three copies of Tri Brigade Arms Bicephalus 2 and three copies of Garura Wings of Resonant Life. So for those of you who don't know, uh, basically this is kind of your removal engine and draw engine in combination with Dogmatica Punishment. So interesting thing about Garura, you absolutely can just send this card by itself off of Dogmatica Punishment. Garura actually has a very low attack stat, and most people don't really notice that because you're probably never using this card for combat unless you're trying to cheat out a, a cheeky, you know, uh, go for game because it actually does double battle damage, which is kind of unique. But it's actually very low attack, and Dogmatica Punishment does need you to have a monster that you send from the extra deck that has attack higher than your opponent. So basically, Garura's going to cap you out at 1,500 attack points as your removal from Punishment. 
That isn't a problem when we play Bucephalus 2, because this card is gigantic for no good reason. It's 3,500 attack. This can remove uh, uh, comfortably 99% of the things you're going to come across in the run of a tournament. And uh, when it's sent, it in turn will then send Garura. So basically, that just kind of circumvents the challenge you might run into. You max them both out at three because you're going to banish a bunch off of your extravagances likely over the course of a game. So you just always want to potentially have access to a free draw. And, and drawing off of punishment and removing a monster with up to 3,500 attack feels really, really nice. So... That's our draw engine, and for an additional removal engine, we're also playing three copies of Elder and Dientis. Uh, 2,500 attack should cover most tools, and sometimes you do just want to get rid of things like, um, you know, back row that you're worried about, a field spell that's giving your opponent lots of resources, things like that. So these are all nine of these cards we just showed are basically just tools for your Dogmatic of Punishment that we max out on ratio, so we always have access to them through... Um, a uh, pot of extravagance. We also are playing two copies of Dengirsu, Orchest of the Evening Star, and two copies of Divine Arsenal, Double A Zeus. Again, we're playing these on higher ratios just because we like to try to get access to them most times. If we do end up banishing both or even all of these cards, it doesn't even feel that bad most of the time because that means you're guaranteed to have your punishment engines online because at most you would have banished two of any of those cards. So you'll always have access to a draw or a pop for sure. Um, so, fun fact, uh, Dingirsu, a little bit of a strange pickup here. The reason we're playing this is because Lady is actually a level 8. Um, and this card basically does turn Lady in, in a situation where you need to uh, kind of remove some cumbersome tool. It can actually turn Lady into a Send and also into a Protection for your other cards from Destruction as well. And Zeus, I mean, you... Summon two ladies, you make Dengirsu, you send a, a card that's in your way, you go battle phase, you overlay for Zeus, and you clear the board if need be. So these are another kind of backup removal engine if things kind of go south for you. Um, I will say these cards did not come up for me over the course of the tournament. Um, I would say these are definitely flexible slots, and if you guys do find that there are particular, you know, maybe there's a level four engine you could run with this for Ariane and Ariana that might be more valuable, maybe Cowboy for Game or funny things like that. So that could be something that you guys could try out for a flexible option as well. And for our last cards, we're actually playing two links, one of Lingaribo and the one of Muckraker from the Underworld. So Lingaribo is kind of a metagame call. I did actually minimize it and only play it at one, even though Cash Tira was running around in my locals, because I didn't actually know if anybody was going to be playing the Ibli stuff. Um, I didn't run into Ibli during the tournament, but I did find out after the fact that there actually was someone playing Ibli, I think, in the side deck there. So definitely something to keep in mind if you're playing in this format. You will want to have something to get rid of Ibli in your extra deck. And uh, Lingari was the best option because it turns Ibli into... It, you know, gets rid of her so you're not getting floodgated, and it turns it into a trap negate, which is very high value, for sure. Um, you're supposed to play this card at two. I definitely greeted out on that. I'm actually playing my second copy in the uh, side deck, which we'll get to in a moment. It, I didn't get punished. I don't necessarily know if I'd recommend it, because Muckraker, as much as I love this card, both for its art and for its really cool effect, uh, I never played this card once. So potentially that would be something, maybe you shuffle those two around, and maybe you get more value out of that by not getting floodgated out at your locals, depending on how many people are running around with Cash Tira and maxing out on their floodgates. So something to keep in mind, but I do think these are both great cards, and I do think maybe you could just swap Muckraker for our second Lingaribo, which we'll get to in a moment. But for that, that is our 15 card extra deck. And for our last cards, we'll go into the side deck. So for the side deck, we are playing triple copies of Lava Golem and two copies of Solemn Judgment. Going second and going third, if you know you are, or excuse me, going like in the match, if you're on, on your second game and you know you're going first, or you're on your third game and you know you're going first, 
just play these cards. Just just play Solemn Judgment. Um, this this card is absolutely going to win you games. It definitely won me a game for sure, um, because sometimes you just need to play around your opponent blowing out your back row, and this card will absolutely come up. Um, so that's that's your going first card. Your going second card, Lava Golem. I cited this card in every time, and every time this card came up and got rid of some kind of boss monster, some kind of floodgate that was just absolutely essential for, for me to get over. So definitely these cards are, are fantastic. I do think I would recommend playing them both if you're you're worried about kind of having flexible going first or going second options. Lava Golem's great in this format, so that's that's a pretty big one. Now, this one, actually, I would say is very flexible, so I wanted to try this out and kind of test it in the field against Cash Tira. I never actually drew it, and I never actually saw what potential value um, I could have had. I did play one Cash Tira player, and over the course of the match, it, it, it never came up once. I do conceptually think this card is very strong, and maybe, it's funny, maybe once the new Dino support of all things, for me to reference in this video, comes out this summer, um, this might actually be a card if Cash Tier is still running around at kind of full power at that point. I would actually consider this this potentially turning into a, a mandatory side deck, or even maybe a main deck option, because... If if there's a ton of decks running around that are heavily relying on banishing, I mean, hey, this this might be the option for you. So I didn't get a lot of value out of it. Maybe you guys got a lot of value out of it. If you've tried experimenting with this, let me know what you think in the comments and, and we can take a look. But uh, definitely a potential flex slot there. Um, on to some removal tools. So playing the one of Lightning Storm and the one of Harpy's Feather Duster. Obviously, I know Lightning Storm's still a fairly expensive card to get in higher rarities, so this one could easily be a Raigeki or a Dark Hole. I've actually seen a lot of people running Dark Hole instead because it does give you the option to basically clear an Ibli again if, if you've uh, been floodgated and reset the board and then you can kind of get off to the races. So I think technically right now Dark Hole is probably the better um, card of those two. But if you have it, Lightning Storm is just a good generic removal tool and Harpies for other back row deck matchups as well. So we always do want to play spell trap removal, that's for sure. Now on to probably the most exciting part of our side deck. So we're playing the two of Triple Tactics Talents and the one of Triple Tactics Thrust. So um, first things first, I did, as you guys probably saw on my unboxing video, I did actually only get the one Triple Tactics Thrust from a whole case of Photon Hypernova. That absolutely did not stop me from playing this card in in the tournament and i'm happy to say it absolutely did not stop the card from having high value impact this card is insane absolutely incredible card going second I drew this and was able to resolve it and was able to search evenly matched and completely blow out my opponent and end up ended up winning that game. Um, I do think that Thrust is probably one of the strongest competitive tools that has been released since cards like Triple Tactics Talent. And if you can afford to get it or afford to trade for it, I would really highly encourage you guys giving it a try out because it is absolutely exceptional. Um, I am still playing two Triple Tactics and I did side this card in most games as well. Um, definitely as a one of for sure. Both of these cards by themselves as one ofs, I mean, they're they're your power blowout card. So even if you have access to just to just one of each, I would really recommend considering playing that in either your side deck or even your main deck if, if you have access to them. But they've definitely served their purposes very well. Um, I actually think in one game I drew both of these and they were both live, uh, which was crazy. Um, but uh, but yeah, so uh, definitely, definitely some highlights there. Really high value cards, really strong. Thrust is amazing. Check it out if you can. And the last two cards are a little more boring. These are just kind of filling out our ratios. So the third copy of Nibiru. Again, if we're against Cash Tier, we absolutely want to see this card if we're going second. And Link Revo as well was another optional 
um, side in just to make sure we don't get a bleed. And again, it didn't come up, but it certainly could have. So that's definitely something for you guys to consider. And that is it for everything on the deck profile. So back to the start, we've got 40 cards in the main, 15 cards in the extra, and 15 cards in the side. Uh, overall, I think this deck's really fun. You guys know I am a back row player. Uh, I think it's a very interesting way to play back row where you're more focused on kind of resource managing and a lot of pops and a lot of banishes and sends and interaction and floodgate effects that you just kind of work together in combination to end up kind of grinding your opponent down and ending up winning. I think it's very strong. I think it has a cool place in the competitive metagame and I'm looking forward to seeing what new... Uh, what new trap tools Konami gives us to kind of make this deck better. But what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments down below and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more awesome content like this. That's all from me guys. Thanks for watching the deck profile. Have a great day and have a good one. Bye.